I am Amber Gray, the Vice President, so I am honored to be in front of you all tonight, um, although it is super cold. Um, so I will read a couple of the announcements and then we'll go ahead and get started with today's presentation. Um, let's see, so as always, we have Friday networking on Zoom, so we continue to do that. It is at 11 uh, a.m. on Fridays, and we usually go until about noon. Um, usually people are a little hangry at that time, so they're ready to get off of there. Um, we do have first Fridays with the ASPIA, the, the attorney, um, Ms. Catherine Davis, um, each month as her schedule allows. So even though we, we say she's on there for the first Friday, sometimes it, it varies depending on her schedule. Um, we will enter our fifth continuous year this spring. Um, still, this is a no cost to join. I highly encourage you to enjoy um, this meeting for Friday networking. We talk about all sorts of things as real estate um, uh, investors during this call. Um, there's always a help needed that's put out. If you have a help needed, you never know who could be uh, on the call who could answer your question. So um, please join us for the conversation. Um, next, our, um, a new event is going to happen. Um, we are going back for some of you. I never made it in the past, but I'm hoping to make it um, in the future. Uh, they're going back to the uh, lunches at Applebee's. So if you recall, another great networking event. Um, the Applebee's is the one in Creed Core, uh, 270 in Olive. Actually, you still live around the corner from there. Uh, it is a great location. That will be starting February 5th. Um, again, that'll be from 11 o'clock to about 1 o'clock, but of course, if the conversation is great, no one is going to stop it, and that will be the first Monday of each month. Uh, following that, we have February the 20th, we have our main event, so this will be another good one. Uh, Chris Keelan, uh, he is an STL RIA member, um, and he is the Master St. Louis uh, wholesaler, so I know that there are usually a lot of wholesalers in the room. Uh, on the calls, and so this would be a great conversation to listen in for our main event. Um, in March, the Moolah Shrine Circus, um, they will have in St. Charles Family Arena, um, we will be a proud sponsor of that event, so we will be um, advertising there. More information will be coming soon. Uh, we will have some free tickets that will, will be available. Um, but as of today, if you are interested for yourself or other little ones, um, there are coloring books that are, that are available on the uh, STL RIA website, I believe. Um, I heard also that we may be giving some away and they were just purchased today. Um, and in addition to that, they are available on Amazon if you are interested. Um, March 19th, we have a main event. Um, uh, this one is called The Apartment King by um, Brad Sumrock. He is investing in apartments. So um, that I'm extremely interested in, and I hope you all can join that meeting as well. Brad has a scientific approach to real estate investing. He is a national speaker that has been on the stage for many years with Robert Kiyosaki. I think some of you probably know him uh, more, more so as Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So, um, as well as many others. So if you are invest interested in that one, please come to our March event. Um, Brad will be hosting his annual investing uh, forecast on January 31st um, at 7 p.m. So for the STR RIA members, we have a special uh, affiliate link. I believe if you're interested in that, you can uh, reach out to uh, any of the board members um, and then we'll, we'll, we will be uh, sending out emails to that specific web, uh, link. Um, and then for, if you have other information, or if you want other information, you can reach out to the stlria.com and then uh, kind of uh, contact us that way if you're interested in learning more. So um, before I get to today's main event, um, we usually start out with our haves and wants. So I'll start um, and I'll just kind of scan the room if there's anything that you have, if you have a service, if you have um, uh, a unit that you're looking to sell, if you're looking for a unit that you want to buy, uh, now would be the time. So I'll um, let anyone start if they have anything that they'd like to uh, present to the room.
Hi, my name is Brian Stanley, a local real estate investor. I'm uh, looking for properties in North County, rehabs in West County, South County. Um, I'm also the uh, owner of a real estate, I mean, a HVAC business, been in business for about 25 years, serve a lot of investors. Um, feel free to ask me any questions. And my phone number is 314-494-6176, or I do have some cards available. Anyone else? No has and wants? That's crazy. <laughs> Not yet. All right, no wholesalers in the room? Nothing? Hi, I'm Dana Gray. I am a real estate owner in the Tower Grove area, and I work with Tower Grove Community Development Corporation. And we are looking for the properties that have been long neglected um, and are too costly for the um, for-profit entity to improve. Um, so if uh, there are any properties that you know of in the Tower Grove area, in the Bevo area, in the Dutchtown area, um, please let us know. We're at towergrovecbc.org. Can I ask you what you do with those properties? Uh, we work with Legal Services of Eastern Missouri to um, use the courts to force the owner to either improve the property or if they are not wanting to improve the property, then we sue to force them to uh, improve the property. And what has happened thus far is a judge will order the improvements. If they don't do the improvements within a matter of a specified time, usually six months, then the courts will um, give our organization the rights to make the improvements ourselves. Um, and then they will have a court order to repay us for that investment. And then if they do not repay the costs for that um, investment in stabilizing the building, then they will force have a court order to force the relinquishment of the deed. And so then if it is a multifamily property, well, depending on where exactly it's located, we will retain multifamily properties for our rental portfolio in Tower Grove South, Shaw, Southwest Garden, and Bevo. If it's outside of that area, then we will, if single family properties will sell, or we work with developers that have a proven track record of um, improving the properties, retaining the properties. We're not looking for people that want to flip because we're wanting to keep properties affordable. All right, anyone else? No one has and wants. All right, everyone just is excited for today's uh, main speaker. All right, so tonight we have a timely subject and a very special guest. Um, that has crafted her presentation specifically for SGL RIA, real estate taxation and how to master it as an investor. Whether you operate your business as a sole proprietor or a real estate LLC, you better operate correctly. We will be gaining valuable insight on some unique tax benefits, understand, the, understand liability as well as potential deductions. We'll also be finding out about what top software solutions you should be using to track your expenses and simplify your processes. Our special guest tonight is a senior manager with Adder CPAs and investors. Adders and not my Aders. Anders. Anders has over 55 years of service and is passionate about servicing you, the investor. Please give a warm welcome to CPA Miss Elizabeth Watkins. Thank you. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Is this, is this okay? All right. Well, 
as mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Watkins. I'm a senior manager with Anders. Uh, we're located downtown. We also have an office out in Chesterfield now, which is exciting. And I am here this evening to talk um, tax law with you as regards to your um, real estate investing activities. So first up is um, a bit of an agenda. Um, these are some some of the topics that I thought of as I was thinking what might be of interest to you. So discussing what makes for passive activities, um, talking about the tests needed to qualify as a real estate professional, um, the tests that um, you have to pass to establish material participation, owning your real estate, how best to own the real estate. Um, briefly touch on some of the software programs for managing and tracking your activity, and then um, lastly, just a few quick 2024 tax updates because I can't give a presentation at this time of the year without talking about tax updates. All right, so first up, I'm um, going to discuss um, what makes for passive activities. Um, in general, when talking about real estate activity, real estate investing, the IRS kind of defaults to treating these activities as passive, which means that, um, or it's an, which means that any of your losses incurred are going to be limited. Um, a passive activity is an activity in which you do not materially participate. As mentioned, I'll be discussing the test that you need to hit to make material participation, but just know that if you do not materially participate, then um, your involvement in your real estate is going to be considered passive. Um, and then the one other um, caveat here is for um, limited partnership interests. I know some of you might own your real estate through um, LLCs that have multiple members, and so typically those are taxed as partnerships. If your ownership is marked for as a limited, uh, if, partnership interest, then um, your default is passive treatment on that, the activity that flows from there. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up. Um, as I mentioned, passive activity losses um, are not just something you can deduct full out the year that they're incurred. You are at first limited to any passive activity income. Um, so passive activity income might be things like interest and dividends, of course, income from other rental activities that you have, um, but you can't just fully deduct losses in the year that they're incurred. You're gonna have to, um, you're gonna be limited to the income that you've earned from other passive activity. Certain taxpayers though can deduct up to $25,000 of passive losses and this is specifically for real estate um, activities. So that's um, good news for you all on that front. Um, thankfully, if you do incur losses that you're unable to deduct in the current year, they're not just gone. Um, they're simply suspended, and those losses are carried forward to future years when you do have passive income to offset them with. Um, now, the nice thing is that in the year that you might dispose of or liquidate an activity, you can fully deduct all of those suspended losses. So you sell a property or you liquidate your interest in the property. Any losses that have built up over the years that you've been un unable to deduct, you can fully deduct in that year of disposition. So you would get to deduct any of the current year losses that you've incurred, and then also all of those prior year suspended losses. So I had mentioned that there is a special allowance for deducting up to $25,000 of a loss from a rental activity. So now I just wanna cover the rules um, around that special allowance. Um, in order to be eligible for this, the taxpayer or the spouse must actively participate in the rental activity. Um, this means that the taxpayer or their spouse has to own at least 10% of the rental activity of the rental property, and then you have active participation. And the IRS is the rules are a little different from active participation from material participation. Um, 
And some of the things that the IRS outlines as regards to active participation are that you're making management decisions, you're approving new tenants, you're approving the, the rental terms or the lease terms, um, you're the one arranging for the repairs or any of the capital improvements. Um, that would meet active participation as regards the, um, the special allowance. Um, when calculating how much of the $25,000 you can deduct, you first net all of the income and, and losses from any rental activities in which you have active participation. Um, so let's say in any given year, you've got a $10,000 of income from one in which you actively participate and you have a $15,000 loss in another property the net that you'll be able to deduct is $5,000. Um, if we change the, the facts of that little example, you have $10,000 of income and let's say $40,000 of loss on another, well, you'll net those, and the net $30,000 loss, you only get to deduct up to $25,000, and then the rest of the five is suspended and carried forward to future years. Now, the other um, caveat with this allowance is that, of course, the IRS thinks that if you make too much money, you shouldn't be allowed this deduction at all. So if your adjusted gross income is anywhere between 100000 or 150000 the loss is limited and then completely gone. And you're, I'm sure you all are aware, but I'll, adjusted gross income, you're looking at other sources of earnings as well, so any wages, um, any income you might be earning from um, self-employment or S, you know, if you own an S corporation, things like that. Um, that's the, what's going to help make up adjusted gross income. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, next, um, I wanted to touch on some of the requirements to being considered a real estate professional. Because, kind of as we were, as we were mentioning before, um, you, you, the default treatment for um, rental activity is passive, and so you don't get all, necessarily all of the benefits um, if some of your properties are accumulating a lot of losses. So um, one of the designations available to you is to be considered a real estate professional. And this can, of course, have a considerable impact because it might allow you to deduct some of those losses beyond that special allowance. Um, in order to qualify as a real estate professional, the IRS has two tests that you have to meet. It's a both and. So you have to meet both of the stipulations um, in order to have this designation. Um, and these are that the taxpayer must perform more than 50% of their services in a real property trade or business in which they materially participate. Um, this means that 50% of your time needs to be spent on real estate activities. Um, the second test is that the taxpayer must perform more than 750 hours of service in real property trades or business in which they materially participate. Um, so, types of services that you might be performing are real property development or redevelopment, construction, reconstruction, acquisition, um, your rental, operation, management, leasing, or brokerage trader businesses. Something to note is that you don't actually have to have a license or a certificate to be considered a real estate professional. So you don't have to have your real estate license um, in order to be considered a real estate professional. Um, something to note with this is that any services you perform as an employee in a real estate trade or business, so you work for a real estate firm or brokerage, um, those services as an employee do not count towards this 750 hours. This, those 750 hours have to be separate from that, um, from your services as an employee, unless you're a 5% owner of that company. Um, so if you own a brokerage or you own a real estate firm, um, then those services and those hours count 
if you don't have ownership though they do not count and you're going to have to keep a separate log separate records for the time that you're spending um, towards real estate activities all right next up is so a lot of the um oh yes Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So the question was if you're a regular W 2 employee, you know, kind of a standard nine to five job, and you're do those hours count towards the overall? Um, 50% of your time being spent in real estate activities, and yes, they do. Mm -hmm. So it's going to look at how do you, as an income earning taxpayer, spend your time? Is more than 50% in real estate, or is more than 50%, say, as an engineer, or a teacher, or an accountant? Or um, so, yes, the IRS looks at all of your time for the year. Mm -hmm. That's the person. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. The per yeah. Right. Yes. The the rules we're going to cover on material participation are looked at by property, um, but to um, obtain this real estate professional kind of designation, that's um, total hours, global hours, if you will. It averages to about 14 or 15 a week because um, the IRS is when they say more than they mean 751 or so. um, and like I said yeah about 14 to 15 hours a week are spent on activities that um, like it said real property development things like that rentals So material participation came up quite a bit in the tests that are um, you need to hit in order to be considered a real estate professional. So what does the IRS mean by material participation? Um, again and again, just want to reiterate because it can really it can have a significant impact on your um, tax situation. Um, because if you materially participate, you may be able to deduct more of the losses that could be accumulating in your um, properties. Um, the other nice thing is that with material participation, um, your rental income, rental activity would not be subject to the net investment income tax, which is an additional 3.8% tax on investment income. Um, and then the IRS has seven tests that you have that you have to look at in order to make material participation. The nice thing is that you only have to hit one of these seven. With the real estate professional, you had to hit both, but with material participation, it's just one of the seven. And um, I will be honest, I do not have these memorized <laughs> because um, they're they can be me, if you will. Um, so here they all are. Um, I think you'll be getting a copy of these slides or this presentation afterwards, so you'll have this to reference. Um, but the seven tests are that you participated in the activity for more than 500 hours, or your participation was substantially all the participation in the activity of all the individuals for the year including an individual who doesn't own any interest in the activity. So you hire a property manager. Um, you still have to provide substantially um, more time than they do working or managing the property. Um, another of the tests is that you participated more than 100 hours and you participated at least as much as any other individual. So again, someone like a property manager. Um, the activity is a significant participation activity, 
and you've participated for more than 500 hours. Um, another of the tests is that you materially participated in the activity for any five of the 10 immediately preceding years. Those five years do not have to be consecutive, which is nice. <laughs> um, the sixth test is that the activity um, is a personal service activity in which you materially participated for, oh, for any three preceding years. And then lastly, um, based on all of the facts and circumstances of your situation, you participated in the activity on a regular, continuous, and substantial basis during the year. I will say that um, it's a good idea, a tip, to keep substantial, um, keep logs of all of your time and of all of the um, work that you're doing towards these properties when the IRS questions material participation or questions that a real estate activity has been marked as non-passive and so losses were taken. One of the things that they're going to ask is proof of material participation. And usually, you know, if you keep some kind of log book of your hours, if you keep um, a mileage log, you have properties all over the city and you can show I was going here and there and everywhere um, addressing um, you know, tenant concerns or um, managing the properties, overseeing repairs, capital improvements, that sort of thing. It's always a just best practice to keep um, very detailed records in order to prove basically material participation. Um, one of the things to note about material participation is that um, participation in managing the activity doesn't count in determining um, whether you meet the tests if one or more of the following, these following tests apply. So if someone other than yourself received compensation for managing the property, or an individual spent more hours during the year managing the property than you did, and then finally, um, as I mentioned before, with real estate professionals, real estate salespeople can't count your hours worked as a salesperson um, with your rental real estate activities for the purposes of determining material participation. So again, your hours spent as an employee of a brokerage or um, you know, a Remax or something like that don't count towards the hours needed to hit material participation um, for it any given activity or any given property. So, in that case, my wife does a lot of the work. Mm -hmm. I, I do the work. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I have hours to Um, it is for material participation, yes. So yes, a, a taxpayer and a spouse can group their time worked on a property in order to meet these tests. So yes, your wife spends 200 hours, you spend 301. Um, together you hit the 500. Um, you then meet the, the tests required for material participation. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did everyone catch that? Sure. So the tests to um, be considered a real estate professional are separate from the tests needed to make material participation. And just because you meet the test for to be considered a real estate professional does not mean you've met the test to make for material participation, which would allow you to deduct you know, up to $25,000 of losses or, um, yeah. Is that, yes. Wait a second, with questions, can we have the, can we use the mic so we can Oh, yes. Yeah, about 90% of the people are at home right now, and we need to do a conversation for the long time. No, don't mind. Can we have more questions until the end? I was just going to ask if if we had one property that was worth a hundred thousand dollars and our rent is you know a thousand dollars a month, are we going to be able to take advantage of any of this, or do we have to be at a certain threshold in order to start taking advantage of the losses and the different things? You do not have to be at a certain threshold. The property doesn't have to be valued at a certain uh, fair market value, and the rents don't have to be a certain dollar amount. Um, it's really your time and your basically your time and your energy spent. So there's a scenario where I could take twenty five thousand in losses on my one rental property. I mean, if you've actually incurred twenty five thousand dollars of losses, um, so you know you're. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I can uh, give an opinion on that necessarily, but okay. yeah, a thousand dollars a month in rent, twelve so twelve thousand dollars of revenue for the year, and after real estate taxes, maybe your mortgage interest, um, you had to replace the HVAC, you had um, you were covering utilities. I mean, you could insurance, um, fitness, lawn care. I mean. There are absolutely scenarios where you would quickly rack up more expenses than the income that you're generating. Um, and so, yeah, I mean. So it's yeah. possible, in which case I would want to meet these standards so that I could take those losses. Correct. Instead of it just being a hobby. Right, and limited to the income that it's generated. So in that scenario, if you don't meet these tests, then you're going to be at a net zero from a tax perspective. You generated twelve thousand dollars of income, so you can only deduct up to twelve thousand dollars of expenses, and then any additional expenses are what we call suspended. You can't; they're just, they're just lost for the current year, and then they roll forward as a carry forward um, for future years. But I'm not going to make any more off of it because I'll be in the same boat the next year. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is a quick one. I think it's relevant here, though. Is there a limit on the amount you can carry forward? I thought there was per year. No. No. Not from. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Wasn't there something at one time where there was a three thousand dollar limit? That's capital. That's capital That's losses. Capital losses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, capital losses. You can. You can claim it well, you can only claim up to three thousand dollars of capital losses, anything can carry forward. Um, yeah. Okay. So next I wanted to cover um, some ideas around how to own your real estate, whether through LLCs or um, you know, individually or directly, as we say. Um, so this first option is just if you're going to own your property outright. Um, to the IRA, they would call this a sole proprietorship, basically. Um, you own it just through your name, your social. Um, you're the sole owner, so of course um, that then gives you all of the management rights, all the management decisions. You're the one, you have 100% control over how that property is run. Um, 
who you rent it to, um, any improvements that are made, how long you hold it, when you sell it, things like that. Um, the downfall is that, yes, you're not as well shielded from liability should anything happen to someone on the property and they um, go to sue you, it's you individually who are gonna be um, on the hook. Um, one of the benefits of owning uh, real estate um, is that you might qualify for the 20% qualified business income deduction. I'm gonna talk about that a little later on, but just know that this deduction is out there for you at this time if you do own um, property as a sole proprietorship. The next option is to own your real estate through what we would call a limited liability company or for short an LLC. Um, this does just what the name suggests. It is a nice buffer or kind of a hedge of protection around you um, should anything happen. Um, it's, a, it's a limit on your liability. <laughs> um, now, a an LLC can still be run as um, just you with a single owner. We would call that a single member LLC. There's no real change from a tax perspective if you own the property outright as a sole proprietor or if you own it through an LLC. Both types of ownership result in the same tax on your individual return. There's no separate tax filing to be a single member LLC. Um, everything just goes right on your return the same way it would if you were just operating as a sole proprietor. An LLC though does allow you the benefit of bringing on other investors or coming together for with a pool of people and investing in real estate. Those would be multi-member LLCs. We and the default tax designation is going to be as a partnership, and that is always what we recommend. We would not recommend owning real estate through um, like an S corporation or a C corporation. It just gets very difficult um, to get the property out of the entity later on, or um, the taxation becomes a lot more um, cumbersome, if you will. Um, and so if you have a multi-member LLC, as I said, it, it will be um, taxed as a, a partnership. You would have to file a separate tax return, um, a partnership return on a Form 1065, and then your pro rata share of that activity comes to you on a Schedule K-1, and then that Schedule K-1 is what gets reported on your individual return. Um, another type of um, ownership structure, if you is to use um, almost like a holding company, if you will, for your rental properties. You can set up an LLC um, that can kind of be the master LLC, the big umbrella, and then you could set up other LLCs that are owned by that umbrella. Um, and so each property is separated out to, to again, help with shielding of the liability between the properties. Um, so that's always an option as well. You can have um, as many single member LLCs as you want for all of your various properties, um, and then either own all of those single member LLCs outright or own those through, like I said, kind of an umbrella holding company. It really just depends on what's best for your situation, how extensive are your real estate holdings? What type of real estate are you operating? Is it a commercial property? Is it a big apartment complex? Is it condos, um, short-term rentals, you know, smaller, um, just single family homes? It kind of just depends. And so we always recommend, you know, working with your attorney or your accountant to figure out really what's best for your situation um, with regards to sole proprietorship or an LLC and then how to really structure that LLC. And then again, if you um, have all of your property through an LLC, this too can qualify for that 20% qualified business income deduction. So I wanted to just take a few moments to discuss this. You all, hopefully you're aware <laughs> um, of what this is. This um, 
The Qualified Business Income Deduction was enacted with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and it is a 20% deduction on qualifying business income um, for the tax years 2018 through 2025. When the top corporate tax rate was reduced from 35% down to 21%, this um, business deduction was um, introduced to sort of level the playing field because all of a sudden it looked a whole lot uh, nicer to operate a C corporation than it had in the past. Um, so that's kind of the, the why behind this deduction. Um, and it is, like I said, a 20% deduction on income from a qualified trader business. Generally speaking, the, the IRS says that real estate meets the test to be a qualified trader business. The tests for this particular deduction are separate from the test for material participation, separate from the test of real estate professionals. So um, just know that. So even if you don't meet material participation or you don't meet the test for a real estate professional, you, pr you can still meet the test for your rental activity to be considered um, a qualifying trader business for the purposes of this deduction and take advantage of this deduction. Um, so in order to meet the tests, the IRS says that um, your rental activity or that you as the taxpayer have to be involved in your rental activity on a regular and continuous basis. And they have kind of three broad categories for what that looks like. So what are your efforts to rent the property? You know, um, is it available for rent or does it just sit bank, vacant? Um, and then it, as the taxpayer, or do you have an agent who's maintaining or repairing the property? Um, so again, you can hire contractors. It's not that you have to do the repairs yourself. You can have a property manager helping facilitate all those things. It doesn't necessarily have to be you. Um, and then yes, your management of the property. And then there is a safe harbor for real estate enterprises. So if you have a group of properties, um, does the group meet the tests to be considered um, a qualified trader business for the purposes of this deduction? Um, one thing to note is that there are certain types of properties that just don't qualify for this deduction. So if you've got a property under a triple net lease, or you're renting out part of your residence, your personal residence, let's say you have a vacation home in Florida or something. Um, and then any, if any part of your real estate interest is treated as a specified service trader business, I'm not gonna go into the rules around that, just know that that is a separate, um, it's a separate test and it might disqualify your rental activity from this deduction. And then, of course, there are limitations. Um, the 20% deduction is limited to 20% of your overall taxable income. Um, so that's after factoring in all of your standard or itemized deductions, all of your other sources of income, um, things like that. And then, of course, there's a phase out, and it, it depends on your filing status. Um, and it's indexed for inflation every year. Uh, and then once you hit that phase out range, there might be other things that you have to look at with calculating this deduction, any wages paid or the basis of your property. Those are all going to come into play with regards to this 20% deduction. Um, and then any prior year losses on the property have to be netted with current year income in order to calculate the 20% deduction. Just know that Kind of broadly, there is this 20% deduction for qualified business income, but then, of course, different tests, different limitations, things like that to keep in mind um, for your planning. Questions? Uh, Elizabeth, in your experience uh, at your firm, how with rental property, how many people have the sole proprietary or proprietary? Uh, you know what I'm trying to say? Yes, operation versus sole proprietorship. Proprietorship versus LLC. Are most people doing the, the LLCs? Or 
property by because mm -hmm. I, I would see that I'd be concerned not having an LLC part because of the liability uh, or lack of liability protection. But if they're so, what are they doing? Well, why are they doing it at sure. all? Not just going straight with the LLC. Right. Um, yes, I would say most often I see that property is held through an LLC. If it's not, it's maybe because they're just getting started and they haven't, maybe they haven't considered it yet, or um, it, they just hadn't, their activity isn't substantial enough that it would warrant an LLC. Um, in that case, I'm thinking of somebody who, you know, maybe it was their, the condo that they bought their first, it was their first home, kind of a condo or something, and they decided to keep it and rent it. And they purchased a you know a new main home, um, something like that, where it's just much smaller, and they're just getting going. Um, but you know the the larger, um, more extensive real estate investors that we see um, do have LLCs, and each and then there's kind of their properties are broken out amongst multiple LLCs um, again to separate the act from a legal perspective to keep the activity separate, not necessarily from a tax perspective to keep it all separate, but at least legally and for yeah, liability purposes. Um, can you go back one slide real quick? Um, what is a triple net lease property? Yes. Um, so, oh goodness, this is Gina, I might need your help. Yeah. Um, just to make sure I don't get that. Yeah. I can. Yeah. yeah. So, a triple net lease is commonly whenever a corporation or a business owns its own real estate. So, maybe you have a business that you operate out of the building that you also own, but you own them in two different entity structures. So when you have a triple net lease, your operating entity is the one that's usually responsible for paying real estate taxes, insurance, um, you know, general maintenance and upkeep. So really all that's happening is the landlord, your other entity is just essentially collecting a rent check. And so it's, it's really all the operational, the quote unquote business component of the real estate is really outside of the entity that's owning the real estate. In that case, the income you can't shift a bunch of rental income over to your LLC to generate us, you know, a really attractive deduction with this QBI because it doesn't qualify. Um, another scenario that we see commonly is if our operating entity is a C corp. C corporations, because they're at a flat twenty one percent tax rate, do not qualify for this QBI deduction. And when you're in that situation, if you're renting to a C corporation entity, you automatically are disqualified from the QBI deduction as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I have a few questions on the LLC. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them that is if you have an LLC and a husband and wife own it together, is that a partnership? Um, not necessarily. It could qualify as it's what's called a qualified joint venture. And so it wouldn't need a separate partnership filing. Mm -hmm. And that would, if they're married, now they have to have be married filing joint yeah. tax return. And so you could just report that on their individual return. There's a box that you check, or you have to, um, but then otherwise, you know, you don't necessarily need to file a separate return. Okay. Uh, another question in that line. Um, as far as 1099s and LLCs, do you need to send, if a, a, a company is an LLC, do you need to send them a 1099? Um, it depends on how they're taxed. So um, a single member LLC, yes. Um, an LLC being taxed as a partnership, yes. If the LLC made an S election and is being taxed as an S corporation, then no. LLCs can also make elections to be taxed as C corporations. And so no, that one wouldn't need a 1099 as well. So kind of whenever you receive the W-9 from the LLC that you've been paying, they have to indicate to you 
how they're taxed. Mm -hmm. And so that would then help you make the determination for whether or not to send a 1099. So for a partnership then on that uh, checklist, then they are, they should They mark, it. yeah. Mm -hmm. But if there's, and, and if it's a single member also, then they need to get it even though they're taxed as an S corporation? Well, so you can be a single member LLC and still operate as a, um, kind of on, as a sole proprietorship. You don't make any sort of S selection in that situation. Um, but if the LLC has made an S selection, then yes, um, because then it's a corporation, and so it's required to receive. I'm sorry, it's not required to receive a 10 ms I got that backwards. Um, once you're considered a corporation, you don't have to receive a 1099. So S corporations and C corporations don't need to be issued 1099s. Okay. But a single member LLC that just operates more like a sole proprietorship for tax purposes does need to receive one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I was running around trying to get all these contractors, you know, to do, <laughs> and the, the part about the, the way I understood, if you're an S or C corp, you don't have to worry about that. And that's what I'm hearing from you, right? Yeah. yeah. But if you are not an S or C corp, mm -hmm. then you do have to worry about it, but it's only if you pay them more than $650 for the year. So if it's under 600, I think that's right, Six, number 600. 600. Right, mm -hmm. if we pay them under 600, we do not have to worry about a 1099. Is, is that correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. And I know a lot of people aren't doing that, but yeah, <laughs> you know, the whole thing about the 1099s for yes. these guys that are running around that aren't S or C corps or just Joe Blow, I, I do painting, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then you deduct, you know, $2,000 you pay this painter. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the IRS come back on anybody yet for that kind of, and not have the paperwork or? You have? Yes. You have seen it. And then this allow the, I think a lot of investors are missing the boat on that particular point. A lot yes. of investors. Those are called match, yeah, matching notices, if you will. It's one way that they're caught from. I'll just chime in on this. I, I view 1099s as kind of a banana. Nobody wants it, but you kind of just got to have it. Um, if you're doing the right thing and you're at least trying to obtain the information, collecting the W-9 before you issue the contract or whoever the vendor is their last payment, that's oftentimes your leverage. Um, so tracking that, maintaining the W-9s, doing your due diligence, as long as you're trying your best to file the 1099s, there is a checkbox on your return that we're required to say yes or no, we did, we were required to file 1099s, yes or no, we did or didn't file them. And I have been through many audits where as long as you're doing your due diligence on that front, they're not gonna go down your general ledger and look for any outliers. You paid somebody $150,000 and we have a 1099 then that may come into play during the audit. Um, but I will tell you, I don't want anybody to lose sleep over not being able to issue because I've had many clients where they're like, John Smith just will not give me his social security number because he does not want to pay income on this. You can't force the hand on it. So all you can do is your best due diligence on that. So next, I just wanted to touch on a few programs that are out there for tracking um, and helping to manage your real estate activities. Um, excuse me, these are some of the, um, I guess, the more prominent ones that I see. These are all, all have online platforms, um, helping collect revenue, linking to your bank account, linking to your credit card, um, and then tracking expenses as well. Um, we always let our clients decide which program works best for their situation. I would say that most often I see QuickBooks online. Um, Yardi, that one there at the bottom, I see with a lot of bigger operations because um, Yardi is very helpful for tracking 
multiple investors across multiple types of, of properties. Um, so that's really a, a pretty robust program. Um, but these are just a few of the other options out there that you can subscribe to. I would say that, again, it kind of just depends on where you are with your real estate investing. I have some clients who, it's actually a mix. Some, they'll send me their QuickBooks Online financials, and then they also send me spreadsheets. Um, so it really just depends on what is best for your situation. Regardless, I would recommend that you have separate bank accounts for your real estate activity, that it's not all running through your personal checking account or you're not um, running everything through personal credit cards. It just makes the record keeping very difficult and onerous. Um, and then, you know, a separate bank account for every single property is certainly incredible but I realize that's not necessarily feasible. Um, so it really is just a matter of um, what's best for your situation. And then, um, like I said, just making sure that you can, you can keep clean records, especially if the IRS ever questions your return, pulls it for audit. Um, it's gonna be so much easier to provide them the documentation and the substantiation they're asking for when they want to know, um, you know, what proof do you have that you actually incurred this expense? You can just hand over your rental real estate LLC checking account statement and say it's right here. Um, so yeah, if you aren't quite ready yet to use, you know, a platform as one, such as one of these, then I just would recommend at least having separate bank accounts, separate credit cards, um, things like that, so that you can keep track and keep really clean records. Uh, again, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. Um, man, it's funny because the two I see most often I put at the bottom. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, huh? Oh, so, so yeah, sure. Uh, Quicken, FreshBooks, NetSuite, Sage Accounting, QuickBooks Online, Accountant, which QuickBooks Online has a lot of different options. Um, and then Yardi is the very last one. Yeah, QuickBooks Online is the one we most often see. And you can tail QuickBooks Online, it's kind of you can start with the most the, um, the smallest, if you will, and sort of graduate up to what um, you need as your activity grows and as your needs grow. Um, but yeah, QuickBooks Online is the most common. Because it's cloud-based um, and it's really, it's pretty user-friendly um, just with the reporting, the, the connectivity to your bank accounts, dumping in transactions. I think it's just kind of the modern sort of like coming into the, yeah not you know, current times, if you will, going cloud-based, things like that. Um, it's easy to allow access to multiple users. Um, I know I just find that QuickBooks desktop anymore to be a little bit more clunky, um, at least from an accountant standpoint, it's a little bit more difficult to share the file um, to make changes on our end and then get them back to the client, whereas QuickBooks Online is more, at least from our more real time, as many, you know, the question was how many, why QuickBooks Online versus QuickBooks Desktop? That was the first question. And then how many entities can you have? As many as you need. The nice, you can classify properties within QuickBooks Online. I've got um, a client, yeah, within the one login, they have, I don't even know, five, six properties within there and they've created different classes, and so you can isolate each property if necessary. I don't know, Jane, you've seen more of it. Well, I was just gonna say, because when we started, you know, back in 2018, 2016, something like that, we, we had on the desktop version, and they said you can go to online, but every entity would have to have their own login, and at that point, it was gonna be like every, it was like, 
you know, you're paying the same price over and over and over again. So we said, no, we'll just keep using desktop. So to okay. hear that you can view all the different entities together online is new stuff. Through one, yeah, through the one login. Mm -hmm. You can have uh, one login for multiple entities, but you mm -hmm. need to get to pay separate vendors. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I have uh, one login for two properties, no, so two LLCs. But each LLC you have to pay membership, uh, monthly membership fee, separately. Mm -hmm. But one login. Okay. Yes, so yeah, when I was mentioning the classes before, um, that's one pro one LLC, if you will, but then, um, you know, the LLC owns four or five properties and you can have the different classes underneath the one LLC. I don't know if that makes sense. So if, got, if you have multiple bank accounts set up, you can have them all within one QuickBooks file. So you can pay that one monthly charge, but then as long as you're at a certain level within QuickBooks, and I apologize because I don't know the exact tier that it puts you in, you can turn on classes. And with classes, you can set up property A and property B. Property A is only operating out of checking account one, and property B is only operating out of checking account two. So you can have all of that activity with one QuickBooks file. So one, so $40, $45 a month charge. What you're talking about over there is you have different LLCs set up, so you've set up a separate QuickBooks file, and you've got $40 times two. For that situation, you can do it either or. There's no requirement from us, from the IRS, from anybody that you have to have it in a separate account. It's really how it works best for you. You know, I kind of think of it as do you have one Excel spreadsheet or do you have a separate tab for each company? And with QuickBooks, that's the nice thing about online or even desktop is you can have multiple real estate activities in one file if you want to. It just takes due diligence because I always think QuickBooks is crap in and crap out if you don't take the time to put it in. You're not going to get a report back. <laughs> Not necessarily, as long as you're tracking it by property, again, using those classes, you can run a PL for property one and property two very easily out of there. It doesn't expose you anymore to the IRS. You're still going to have to provide them with reports, so as long as your reports are supportable with your documentation, then yeah. And I will say, QuickBooks Online, they're for seniors, essentially. Essentially. Yeah, that last comment was just to say that eventually it will all be QuickBooks Online. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just going to, that was part of my question I was going to ask, because we get asked here a lot, um, having multiple bank accounts doesn't necessarily matter. I don't know, we, when, like I said, we get asked and some people say, well, every property of mine, I have a specific bank account, you know, 10 bank accounts for each, or one bank account for each property. I don't understand why, but some people do. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it, yeah, it doesn't, as Jane mentioned, it doesn't, you know, expose you to more risk to have that, to have multiple bank accounts. Um, yeah, it, it probably is a lot more overhead, a lot more time and energy on your part. Um, but yeah. I would just say, don't commingle personal with business or personal with rental. So I have gone through some audits where they didn't always use separate bank accounts. Um, so then what happened during those IRS audits is they looked at every single deposit in both the real estate account and the personal account and questioned it to the point that they had to provide a lot of documentation. So it was just very expensive for this client in particular because they didn't do the tracking. They didn't have the QuickBooks up for the health QuickBooks because they weren't even using it right. It's just very messy. So I think if you only have one account, that's fine. Just keep it tracked. I mean, most importantly, you want to know what your income and losses are by property. And if you should sell one, and you can utilize the suspended losses. If you're not tracking them, don't know. Um, but that's the most important. Whether you have one of those accounts or 15, it really doesn't matter. Yeah, I think that's all I have. And then uh, the last slide here, or um, last topic here, is just a few to touch on some 2024 tax updates. Um, 
For the last few years, we've been enjoying 100% bonus or special depreciation on qualified property um, with the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Well, um, in 23, that 100% deduction phased to 80%, and then in 24, it will be 60%, and then the remaining um, depreciable basis is, um, or, sorry, the remaining basis is depreciated straight line over the useful life of the property, so just know that qualifying property um, bonus is going down to 60% this year. Um, the standard mileage rate in 2024 is 67 cents per mile. I can imagine some of you are going all over uh, the region to manage your properties, to oversee your properties. So um, be sure to keep good records of the mileage that you're incurring because um, you're eligible for a 67 percent uh, or 67 cent deduction per mile. Um, and then not necessarily specific to real estate investors, but um, in 2024, the traditional and Roth IRA contribution limits are $7,000. Those were um, increased for inflation. And then um, same with um, health savings account contributions. This is just a nice, um, another little way to save some money, save some tax dollars. If you're eligible, if you have a high deductible health plan at your um, disposal, um, we always recommend opening HSA accounts um, and putting away money for um, health expenses, healthcare expenses. So um, if it's just you on the health plan in 24, you can contribute 4150. And if you have family coverage, which is just you and your spouse or you and one dependent, um, you can um, contribute up to $8,300. So just a few little tax updates for you. Um, other than that, any last questions? Yes. Uh, on the my, yes, uh, on the mileage, what if you just, you know, you have your truck and you that that you use it strictly for your real estate, and you just write down the mileage at the beginning and at the end of the year and say this is how many miles I drove. Yes. We're good. Yes. That's what we do. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> yep. It's usually the IRS comes back to question the mileage deduction and recreating that mileage log is a process. So that's why we all, you know, but no, you, what you're doing works as well. I go back to the, when you did the LLC structure, mm -hmm. do you see people using and trusting the concept of doing a, a, a series LLC, having a master and then a series under it, or do you do have a separate LLC created, you know, with the Secretary of State for each of the LLCs under the master LLC. So I guess the question is, are series LLCs being used, and are they okay? I do. Yeah, used, but most commonly used as separate LLCs. Yeah. 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 And I don't see a problem with this new title. Damn. Yeah. Damn. 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 Damn property if it was placed in service. So you might be working on a property and it hasn't been placed in service just yet. So you can't start depreciation until you place the property in service. Um, you're actively trying to rent it or you have a renter in there. Um, but yeah, does that answer? on qualifying property it depends on what kind of property you have um so yeah qualifying property um the, sure so in general a single family residence the, the building itself the home itself 
is going to be is not going to qualify for this bonus depreciation. That requires um, depreciation over 27 and a half years, straight line over 27 and a half years. It's different components within your home that might qualify. Um, let's say you bought new appliances for the home or um, you had to improve, do some, some improvements to the home. Um, trying to think of what else it escapes me, all the different all kinds of different things. Yeah, the driveway, things like that. Um, but the building, the home itself, the structure itself does not qualify for this bonus. Mm -hmm. okay. Question in the front yeah. online. Got a couple of them online here. Time you're gonna have to walk away from this if you're doing it. Does IRS consider a 40 hour work week pertinent here, or can one work part time and still need percentages when applicable? Can you repeat that one more time? A 40 hour, I'm sorry, a 40 hour work week? Does IRS consider a 40 hour work week pertinent here, or can one work part time and still need percentages when applicable? Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily a 40 hour work week. It looks at the kind of all hours over the whole year. It doesn't have to be, you have to have worked a certain amount of hours every single week. Oh, okay. Okay, so if, or here's an, yes, as James, maybe I misunderstood the question. If you work a kind of a standard nine to five, 40, you know, job, 40 hour work week. Yes, if you're also doing real estate on the side, if you will, or all day, every day over the weekends, or um, yes, you can, as long as you meet the tests, you can qualify for some of these material participation or active participation or um, real estate professional. So you can, I could be an accountant and also a real estate professional, as long as I meet the tests. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are the new rules for registering the LLC? Do you mean the corporate transparency? I'm Act? Guessing. Sure. Um, registering the LLC. So there is a new, it's not, the IRS didn't come out with this. It's, um, I think it's the FinCEN financial. Gosh, financial crimes, something like that. But the Corporate Transparency Act, it might be what they're asking about. It's new legislation. Um, we are advising clients to speak with their attorney on that, um, with getting their LLC in compliance with the, the laws um, as regards to registering the LLC, the deadline for registering it, whether the LLC is brand new, or has been in existence for many years. The owners, you know, the number of owners involved. Yes, we're advising clients to, to discuss this with their attorneys. Mm -hmm. okay, and please clarify uh, management office in personal residence. Um, oh, your a personal residence would be your your home, your primary home, or your your vacation home, something that you use yourself, you use personally. That would be separate from something where you have tenants full time. Um, you know, that's strictly a resident, you know, a rental property, but you have a second home, let's say a vacation home where you're using it part of the time for personal reasons, for your own family vacation. And then the times that you're not there, um, you are renting it out, um, short-term rentals or to, even longer term, 30 you know, longer leases, things like that. And then a, a management office, that's if you're, I hope I'm answering this correctly, but if you've engaged a management company to help oversee some, you know, kind of like a Cush, I don't know, maybe like a Cushman Wakefield is a big name in the area. Um, they're the ones who are um, kind of managing the day-to-day -day operations or helping you, 
um, with tenant complaints or overseeing repairs and maintenance. Um, they're doing the bookkeeping for you, possibly. Um, is that helping? That answers the management office question. Um, one bank account usually with the managing LLC all owned by you, but each property tracked separately and no commingling of accounts is at the easiest if you will. I mean, that's certainly a good option. I would, yeah, I think that's a good way to do it. it just, we just recommend always keeping separate business from personal. The federal government has new paperwork that's above and beyond initial state filing. All LLC must file new farms for 2024. My question is, what are they? Um, I think, again, that's probably the Corporate Transparency Act, which is new in 2024. Um, or at least, it's been, yeah. To me for 2020 you have to file it by 2024 i would say and again we're just advising all clients to speak with their attorney on um getting those that paperwork filed because it's typically the attorney who has helped them set up the llc so we're advising clients to discuss with their attorney mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. okay lastly here is my contact information should you um, have any questions i do have a couple of business cards don't know that i brought enough for everyone but um yeah myself or even i didn't introduce jane she she's here with me this evening from anders she's been helping answer some of these questions jane is one of our partners at anders she helps lead our real estate group um so as you have learned a wealth of knowledge and experience um but yes jane is here with me as well jane maddox and then um Thank you so much for your time. Um, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. That is everything we have for you all tonight. I uh, appreciate all of the Q&A. Um, I think this was um, especially uh, informative as we look forward to tax season. So I've got a lot of work to do. Uh, <laughs> all right, um, so we have the room for a while. Um, those online, I guess you guys can mingle for a while, but we'll be in the room. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all next month and all of the months uh, this year. Thank you.